Hi, Melkit. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This, I think, is a long overdue episode. You and Sanjay, you know, a couple of guys that I followed for a long, long time, really interested in what you're doing, and you're doing an awful lot. It's really quite entertaining to watch you guys grow your business and the kind of the pace that you've done it and the sort of projects you're doing. So, I'm really keen to get into the um, Savoy's story today and to find out, you know, how you guys have been able to do what you've done. Um, it's not easy, as we both know, you know, in today's day and age, and certainly to stand out from the crowd and um, find out a little bit more about what you guys are planning, how you think the future looks for you know, the property and, and perhaps more specifically the HMO industry and a whole lot more. Before we get into some of the detail, can you tell us a little bit about the Savoy's Empire? What is going on behind the scenes and take us back, you know, through this journey that you guys have been through? Because I know that you guys started in, you know, the early 2000s, but that was some 20 years ago and an awful lot has happened since then. Yeah, sure. So 23 years ago, basically, I went on a night out with Sanjay. We came back to his house. We used to live around the corner from where I live. And he said, just come in for a beer. I said, okay, sure. So I came in and Sanjay actually went to sleep. And I (laughs) sat in the living room with Sanjay's dad and had a beer with him. And he just told me at that point that buy-to-let mortgages are out. He goes, there's never been an easier time to actually get into buy-to-let property because... Prior to that, it used to be commercial mortgages and they were pretty expensive. And it was a big deterrent for people wanting to get into buy to lets or rental properties. So with all that information in my head that night, like 23 years ago, I went back and there was no right move, no Zoopla. We had basically the local Gazette and the local media <laughs> paper. And I went to the middle section where it had housing and I was just like flicking through, flicking through. And I found the property which at that time looked loan market value and it was going to auction in a couple of weeks did a little bit of research about it went with my dad back then because i was in my early 20s to auction and we purchased that 120,000 pounds and when i then looked at what it was actually worth when i called three agents around and they valued it around 160 so i'm like okay wow and at that point i was only on 18k a year on my grad job and i'm like wow i've actually made 40 grand on this property straight away and then just using buy to let mortgages which you didn't have to wait six months to refinance i was able to refinance that at that 160 value pull basically everything back out 85 percent, and then sort of go again so within 12 months we purchased three properties in my early 20s at that point and then that sort of set the trend towards us just procuring more and more properties one thing that I experienced in 2001 was 9-11 happened and lastminute.com floated for those that are old enough to mm-hmm. know. The economy went into free fall. <laughs> yeah. I was in a company that employed 350 people. By the time I got made redundant, it was down to 150. So it made it quite clear to me that you actually need a secondary source of income. So as I then progressed through my corporate careers, as Sanjay did with his, we then combined our resources in terms of capital to purchase buy to let properties that will then help us further down the line. And we never really assumed that we would end up building up such a big portfolio, but we never really interacted with social media. So we were never really posting anything on Facebook or Instagram. So when it came to Savoy's, we sort of did it the other way around. We did 20 years in property and then we said, okay, let's just start playing around with Instagram, just showing who we are. And that created quite a lot of noise. And we never really, I think in the first 12 months, we never really put our face out there. It was only when we entered a deal that we were quite proud of in the Property Investor Awards when we won Commercial Developer of the Year that they posted it out. And we're, okay, let's just embrace change and then say, okay, let's just take it step by step now. Let's show us to be a little bit more out there and share our experiences and show people what we're doing on a day-to-day basis. 
And I mean, you certainly have, and I'm really interested in perhaps talking about that today and, and how you guys have been able to do that so effectively, because it, it is, I think, increasingly difficult now to actually stand out from the crowd and, and make a, a name for yourself and a good and a reputable name. <laughs> I think there's a, a sure. key difference. But your story is almost quite unique in that you did all of the work first and then said, oh, yeah, this is actually what we're doing, everybody else, and kind of let everybody else in. And, you know, we don't see so much of that anymore. I think certainly online, the accessibility to social media and the ease at which people can make things look quite different, much bigger than they perhaps are. It's definitely changed the landscape and you know, you're never quite sure what you're looking at. But with you guys, you know, you guys are the real deal and you've earned your stripes over the last 20 odd years. No, thank you. Um, buying the, the smaller stock and obviously building your way up to where we are now, which is the Savoy's empire. So bring us to the here and now Mark, what are we doing in the Savoy's group? You know, you've got you've got so many strands and arms, and I'm actually keen to sort of hear about how you you guys manage this. But what what is going on these days? So, well, I'll just throw you back a little bit. So, with Savoy's, we actually were going to go live with Savoy's Estates back in 2013, and there was going to be four partners. But what we found was there was disagreements between us in terms of executing and so on. All of a sudden, we were all going to put our own time in for free and then build something slowly. But then one person wanted a wage and one person didn't agree with all the stuff. So technically we just ended up with just myself and Sanjay. I left my job in 2017 and then we said, okay, let's just systemize it. Let's just grow our own business. So in terms of what Malky and Sanjay were doing. And then when it came to 2019, we said, okay, do you know what? We're now ready to go live with Savoy's Properties. Let's pencil that in for the 1st of April. So 1st of April, 2020. So Sanj created a logo and everything. We said, okay, 1st of April, we're going to go live. But obviously, 23rd of March, 2020, we went into lockdown and nothing was the same again. But we said, okay, look, we've got, it's actually a blessing in a way in terms of we've got no distractions. There's no like, you know, football games or you know, <laughs> social events or anything. Do you know what? We can just focus on the business. So we focused on the brand and building it. One thing that we experienced during that time we went into lockdown, we had 10 projects on the go. And one of them was our biggest and most notable project where we took an office and we were converting that into 10 self-contained units. And we also at that point had nine other projects on the go and we finished some projects. We couldn't refinance it. We couldn't pull out, you know, stage payments for developments because surveyors didn't know whether they're allowed to go out and what the guidelines were which then had a massive impact on our cash flow. So that then led to us to understand that actually maybe we need to, with Savoy's, it's not just our own stuff. Maybe if we can help other people resolve their problems in terms of you've got working professionals out there that are too busy with their nine to five, but they also want to get involved in properties. So we can actually help them purchase property in their name, build it and help them manage it. So a complete tense circle. And this is where the development side of the business came along. We also then realized we needed a little bit more manpower with this. So we brought Hardy, who's a partner in the Savoy's development arm. So he's now come a part of that. We have a lending arm and that came across I think in 2018, we teamed up with some ex Shawbrook directors and formed a, a lending company. So we've got a pipeline in terms of funding in place. And we just thought this was an excellent opportunity to actually learn that business from the ground up. But again, when we went into lockdown, they only had one funding line and that was cut. So that business then didn't exist. But we actually, myself and Sanjay, created a subsidiary company below it where we will be lending our own capital to the parent company and they'll be lending it and then providing it back with interest. So even though one company shut, we then had ours and we said, okay, well, we can carry this on. We can work with the broker that we're working with and we can then just call it Savoy's Lending. So that's still ongoing today. And then just recently we've launched uh, Savoy's Education, which is an educational arm what we realized was as we now became a little bit more social turning up to events, there were many people that came up to us saying, oh, well, I've paid 10 grand, I paid 20 grand to this course, but it was rubbish. I didn't really learn anything. So we thought, okay, here's another opportunity where we can solve people's problems. We can make the educational bit affordable and we can actually provide value because we've done 20 plus years 
of this in this industry. So we've now just started with the Savoyas commercial to, to residential crash course, and we've actually offered it at three four nine, which is it is extremely low price for the value that it's providing. But again, the idea is not to become multi millionaires off selling courses; it's just to help people in their journey to develop properties. Do you see yourself as more of a sort of landlord and a developer or more of a, a business owner? Okay. I see myself more as a developer, but what I realized is as we progressed within the whole business is you need to have involvement on every aspect of it. You don't need mm -hmm. to be involved with everything 100%. But now myself and Sanjay never really had, when we approached say lenders and so on, we're always known as Malkit and Sanjay. But what I realized is if you want to make an impact, then you have to create a brand. And this is where the Savoy's thing came about. So we're probably one of the only developers out there with our own financial product, which is with Octane. And again, that was to help resolve a lot of the issues that investors were facing. So what we noticed was we allowed people with money for a deposit, but not for the build. There's lenders out there that if the valuation stacks up on the GDB, that they'll give you the build money, but payments and an arrears. So we came up with a product with Octane where they'll guarantee an exit, but also provide the capital upfront for each stage of the build, which is very unique. And that was back in 2021. And we've been working quite successfully with Octane and our landlord investors. I mean, there's it sounds like there's a huge amount going on in the Savoy's group and it's all very exciting. And I've spoken about this before on the show, but I'm a big fan of having trading businesses alongside the development arms of certainly my own business because like you pointed out it's um you know from a cash flow perspective developing it it sounds exciting it sounds sexy but it's really quite tricky you know when it comes yeah. to cash flow isn't it and I think actually it's important to to really consider what that actually means on a very sort of practical and fundamental level and how are you actually going to make sure that if x y or z happens that the bills can still be paid and things can still continue and with that in mind, Malky, just you know, stepping back from your journey and this process that you guys have gone through and starting with the buy to lets and, and kind of building it up to a development company, doing multiple developments, different arms of your business. For people who are you know younger, um, maybe thinking of a change of career, selling their business, you know, looking at property as an alternative sort of investment vehicle, maybe an income stream, maybe the pension. What advice would you give them in terms of where to start? You and I are big fans of the HMOs and you know, I think that's one of the things that we like to talk about a lot and that they're key parts of our business. But is that the right place to start? Is buy to lets the right place to start? That environment has changed a bit or, you know, is it kind of sod it straight into developments and kind of go big or go home? You know, where do you sit at the minute with all of this? I think it's all a case by case basis. So I think that investor that wants to start, they need to sort of identify what their end goal is. If their end goal is, look, in 10 years time, I want to be in a position where I'm financially free. I don't necessarily need to be reliant on my nine to five and so on, but I need to have say 10 K a month that you need to start at that point and understand what your end goal was and then sort of work backwards and look at what's going to actually provide that. So if you're looking at capital appreciation, then you could probably just buy some buy to lets. You're not really going to be making a huge amount per month, but you know, typically houses have doubled every 10 years and rents go up every 20. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if you look at the figures in the past, that's what's happened. So if it was just about having a lump sum that you can then refinance or just sell those properties, then buy to let is the way forward. We got involved with HMOs back in 2010. And the reason we got involved with HMOs in 2010 around that Uxbridge area of West London where we live was we saw a gap in the market where people were only focusing on student HMOs and social housing with studio prices for self-contained flats around a thousand pounds per calendar month plus bills, you're looking 1200. So we thought it was an ideal opportunity to come in, offer something sort of 600 pounds per calendar month all in where you've got like a studio style ensuite room. So you have to basically, in my perspective, is work out what your goals are and then sort of work backwards. And you don't, there's no rush in doing it. So I meet so many wannabe investors, developers, and they're, they're so keen on doing it. I'm like, well, why don't you focus and understand where you want to be rather than just putting some money and then you're stuck, which is what I've seen. I've seen people invest in the Northeast of England. And obviously you have high yielding properties where capital appreciation is very flat. 
and then their money is now stuck. So understand what you want to do, where you can learn from obviously the likes of yourself, Andy, and us through YouTube. There's a lot of free resources out there. So, and obviously you have networking opportunities where you can go out and you can meet experienced people, just learn from them. One of the biggest ways I've actually learned is when I've met people, not on social media, but just in person. And I just say, let me take you out for lunch and just mm-hmm. for a chat, you know, lunch is on me. And it maybe cost me 30, 40, 50 pounds to take that person out. But the knowledge that you can gain from that person for the cost of that meal is invaluable. I completely agree. I think you've shared some superb advice there. And, and on that latter point there, that's something that I you know, have done for a number of years. And I remember the first time I, I sort of plucked up the courage to ask somebody, you know, if they, you know, I could sort of maybe buy them a coffee and really just get their ear on a few things. And they were welcoming with their time and quite generous and actually helped me with a few things. And that's something that still to this day I try and prioritise. And I find that sometimes all you need is just to kind of, sort of that door to open ever so slightly and you can push it open, you know, with the help of somebody. And behind it can be so many opportunities. And, and I think that in this industry, and I don't know whether you agree, I'm sure I'm sure you do, but so much of it is about people. It's about knowing people who can give you a leg up, point you in the right direction, sort of give you a kind of a shoulder when you need it, give you a pat on the back when you deserve it, sensor check when actually, you know, you, you might be about to make a decision that isn't necessarily going to be the best one. Do you think that even today that, you know, property is a people business? Very much so. So as you know, through developing, you need to be have those people skills. You have to build those relationships with your contractors. There'll be a situation <laughs> where something goes wrong on another site that's ready finished and you rely on your current contractors to go out there to fix it. And they do it on the basis of the relationship that you have with them. So what we try to do is make sure that, you know, when it comes to our contractors, when they send those invoices in, you know, we pay those within three days of receiving them, you know, you keep that relationship because these guys then will save you money further down the line. Whereas if you take, if you've been working with someone for 10 years, they know what standard of finish you want and they know what our demands and stuff are. So it's a lot easier and you need to be less involved. So this is one of the reasons we've been able to scale up and do so many projects a year is because, you know, we build that sort of family within within our group on all all of what we're doing. So whether it's from our broker, our broker we've been working with for the last 10 years, our solicitors we've been working for for the last eight years, uh, our contractors that we're working with, the builders, we've got some that have been there for over 10 years. You guys have been doing this obviously a long time now, 20, 23 years. And um, you hinted at, you know, some of the ups and downs of that, you know, that journey. But for you guys, is there a standout moment, you know, a best moment, you know, in your career, like a particular project or a particular moment in the business, a turning point, something that really stands out that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, sure. So we mentioned earlier that we did a project where we took an office to 10 flat conversion. So I'm a firm believer that you need to understand the rules of the game. Once you understand the rules, it's yours to be played. So... What we tend to find is most people skim a lot of information. You know, they don't really understand it fully on to a HMO where you can probably get six rooms and, you know, they get four. And then you'll sort of lose out on the end valuation. We looked at one site in Burnham where I remember when I was walking around all the other developers out there said, no, it's not really worth it. You're only going to be able to get five flats in there. So on. But I looked at it. I understood the rules of prior approval. And when we secured this, we got permission for 10 flats. So we purchased it for six seventy. We spent five hundred thousand on it, and the end value was two point five million. And we did this. Pro- we started this project during lockdown one, and I finished it during lockdown three. So for us, at that time, where I was unable to order things like tiles and all the rest of it because <laughs> all those depots were all shut, we somehow managed to keep that project on time, considering all the constraints that we had in terms of surveyors and stuff not coming out. We then put that deal forward in 2020 to the Property Investor Awards and we won Commercial Developer of the Year I remember. with that. And we have one other deal where I think for us, it was just, again, just knowing the rules, knowing, having that knowledge and being able to implement it. We looked at a site in Buckinghamshire, it was just a commercial with uppers. And I remember it was up at 475 and when I was walking around, I walked down to the back and there were some detached garages and they were basically... 57 square meters. And I looked at them, I'm like, who owns this to the agent? And it was the, 
landlord owns this, but it's not included part of the sale, but it was in a dilapidated condition because it was probably worth 10K. I said, well, okay, why don't you give me that for free? But I'll buy, I'll buy the, the shop and the uppers at asking price. So I was on a separate title deed. We purchased that because it was accelerating use for the commercial unit. We got planning to change that into like a two slash three bed muse house. So we've got this site for free. It only cost us at that point 40K to get it completely done. It actually looks quite stunning afterwards. Then we got it refinanced and it got valued up at 400,000. And then we put that forward in 2021 to Property Investor Awards and we won Property Deal of the Year. And I remember some of the judges like Jay Howard said, I've never had a deal where I've done 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 on literally everything. So for that, those are the two deals that really stand out for us over those past 20 odd years. Hugely inspiring. And it's funny that you mentioned a site with a bit of kind of something extra down at the bottom. We just did one and uh, it had a, an ancillary workshop on there. And actually we were able to get PD to kind of develop it and turned it into a, a really cool studio unit. And, um, you know, it was just a bit of a bonus that the site had and potential that nobody else had really seen. And I quite like those sorts of sites where there's just something else that with a bit of creativity, you can, you can actually, you know, do something quite special with. I've been in business for about 15 years learned a huge amount along the way and I now realize that you know um, most of it is kind of dealing with problems uh, you know you, you tend to be at the bottom of the funnel where you know all the bad stuff sort of finds its way to you but I, I think that that's kind of really where businesses are made it, you know it's dealing with those problems and you know what what you do when things are tough and, and during the difficult times you know you mentioned something you know a particular time sort of through the COVID period when there was issues with financing um, perhaps this is it, but is there a standout sort of most challenging moment that you guys sort of had to overcome as investors or, or was that it? That was it because obviously the properties that we were managing, we, well, we had agents managing, we brought those all in house. So we had at that point, I remember around that 1st of April, we had so many people that worked for British Airways, Virgin, because obviously we were based around Heathrow Airport. They were just saying, look, I've just been made redundant. I need to leave. And they're just, some of them literally just signed a contract on the 1st of March. So that was difficult. But we had to then make decisions on, okay, look, we can break you early. Maybe you pay a month and so on. And then we had to then occupy those rooms. And we brought in technology such as Matterport tours where people were inquiring, mm -hmm. but we, could, we weren't allowed to do viewings. And we were doing it all virtually and doing virtual sort of check-ins and stuff. So what I found was we had to be a little bit more innovative on our approach. So we somehow got through that. Obviously with the development stuff, we had 10 projects. I think during lockdown one, we finished six of them that I was unable to sort of refinance for about three, three, four months until basically the surveyors were allowed to come out. It was just an, a, a crazy time. But one thing I learned was I said, if we can get through this, we can actually get through anything. So nothing's impossible. I think what I've really taken from that is that all of these things happen, things that you couldn't control, quite serious things that can have a big impact. And actually you guys made some really key decisions and then you actually you know, did something about it. You got in there, took management back, you know, um, got the 3D viewings. And I remember in my business, we we at that time had hundreds of tenants, most of them student tenants couldn't get in any of the houses and the academic cycle, you know, is quite sensitive and we needed to be able to do the viewings, but how could we do this? And all of a sudden we're trying to get all these 3D videos done and things like that. And we were quick on it and then we kind of beat everybody else to it and we got good prices on it and then we got things filled quite quickly. And I think a lot of people at times like that tend to panic, um, procrastinate fascinate a little bit and I think and it sounds like this is the case with you guys that sometimes you've, you've got to be prepared in business and certainly if you're, you're in our game to be able to make decisive decisions decisions that you know actually do you know it could have quite a big impact on your business there's potentially a risk involved but I think sometimes the worst thing to do is, is just kind of sit on your hands when these things are happening around you so it's interesting to hear you guys talk about that and that's the sort of scenario that as a developer, that's a kind of a nightmare scenario, isn't it? Where you've got money stuck in deals, you've got sort of cash flow all sort of getting getting slowed down. So, um, but great to see you guys obviously come out the back of that and flourish. And I'm sure take all of those learnings forwards with you. What do you think the future holds? It's a really interesting time. And kind of the issues that we've had with interest rates, obviously inflation at the moment, you know, we seem to be teetering on, a, you know, on a recession. Will it, won't it? 
How do you feel about things at the moment? How is that affecting your approach to what you buy, what you do, and the decisions that you're making? And how are you guys looking at, I suppose, the next five or ten years in the game? You mentioned that this is a long play for you, but um, we've still got to make decisions today. So how are you guys looking at everything that's happening at the moment? I think it's probably a big opportunity in terms of there will be a lot of properties coming on the market and technically it'll be probably around that sort of 2010, 2011 period that we had where the demand is low, but there's opportunities clearly out there. So even just yesterday, we have just acquired a new site in Windsor, commercial with uppers that we're looking at and that we've now secured less than what we probably would have if it was probably two, three months ago. So there will be opportunities, but there'll be some difficult times ahead. So with the landlord buy to let sector, I think when I last time I read the stats, like 66 rental properties leaving the rental sector every day, you know, it's going to end up leading to a massive demand for properties and, you know, that will only lead to rents increasing. So if you can hold on to your portfolio, then then great. There's going to be situations where people that have had properties, which with the low interest rates, you know, it was affordable and they were making a decent margin. But now if your rental and your mortgage is more or less flat, so, you know, one's just cancelling out the other, you're probably more likely now to, to sell it. And there'll probably be a decline in that aspect. For us, we're going to be focusing on what we do best, which is commercial to residential conversions. And then sometimes we look at the uppers of those. And if they're in the right locations, we then repurpose those to HMOs. So we don't really see that aspect of our business changing in the next five years, but there's going to be big ramifications because I think we're sort of going back to sort of around 2008-9 when interest rates were 5, 5.5%. And that around there is going to be sort of now the norm. And it's going to be, yeah, an interesting time. I think it is certainly going to be an interesting time. It sounds like you guys, similar to us, you know, are prioritizing finding the ways to, to add value, force that value, actually create that, that equity. And I think that that's really important as well. You know, when things could slide, I think going into deals, knowing that you are being incredibly confident that you are going to add value, you know, maybe the surveyor has a bad day when he turns up, who knows exactly where your valuation will come out. But I think going into deals and trying to force that value up and going back to the really basic principles of buying well, adding value. And um, and for me, and like you said, holding stuff, because I totally agree that, that this rental supply is just getting more and more and more squeezed, which is a positive for us, you know, still sounds like the most sensible approach. Do you see this kind of unfold as it unfolds taking anybody out do you think there are some people that might be overexposed do you see that sort of stuff like you know there, obviously there were some fairly dramatic exits around 2009 uh, you know sort of people who were over leveraged you know with rates going up and things do you see that sort of thing happening or do you feel like people are getting out of the market because they can just see their buy to let yields getting squeezed well i think first things first the ones that are probably going to get wiped out earlier are going to be the smaller independent builders of sort of self-contained flats when the only exit was by, uh, build to sell. So obviously we've seen some cases where let's just say the apartments were 400,000 and you're unable to now sell it. If you now go to any lender, what the first thing they do is take 35% off for the new build premium. And then they'll lend on that up to 75% based on the rental calcs. So you could be typically lending against sort of 50% LTV. And most of those developers only have 25% sort of margin in it. Some of the bigger ones will be able to survive. The one, the smaller ones will probably, those companies will probably go under. And from speaking to some of our brokers and, and solicitors that we work with, there's a lot of people that are in difficulty. So that will be sort of the first one to fold. And then you're gonna have sort of the, the amateur landlords that probably got one or two properties, probably been impacted from section 24 that haven't basically found a, a structure to offset all their interests they're probably the ones that are going to go next because with interest rates on the way up they're paying well out of their own pockets just to hold some properties and the whole thing should be classed as a business so if it isn't a business they'll be selling that and then i think after that you'll probably have the government realizing that you know we really messed up with this section 24 looking at reversing that just, I know you've been working on that council tax reform as well. So I think that with 
for HMO rooms is now going to get reversed. And I think they'll then incentivize people to buy homes and stuff again, whether that's reviving help to buy or some other scheme and some stamp duty holiday and so on. And then you'll see the property market boom again. For the last 20 plus years, it's for me, it doesn't really phase me. It just goes in a cycle. I see everyone sort of jumping on it when the market's good. Mm -hmm. Then then it's doom and gloom and they're trying to exit. And then afterwards they you know regret selling and then trying to jump back on again. I don't really see that changing in the next five years. There are obviously some principles that guide you guys and how you run the business and how you look at things over the long term. And I'm sure that those would be great pieces of advice for anyone listening today who either wants to start their portfolio or scale up their existing portfolio. Is there anything that, that really stands out for you guys? Yeah, anything that you and Sanj really kind of feel like are sort of integral to um, that what, what you're doing at Savoy's and, and kind of what you're doing in the property market? Anything that you think some of our listeners could take and, and kind of really put into action? Well, I, ours is sort of based on those principles that when we started like 20 odd years ago, like, you know, the honesty, the hard work, the family aspect, you know, remembering where we've come from. So both myself and Sanjay are from migrant backgrounds where, you know, we were quite working class growing up. And then I think the key thing is empowering people. So our principles are, look, if your definition of being successful is only you being successful, then you're not successful at all. So anyone that joins us at Savoy's, we then help them with their own personal development as well as obviously just working with us. So Hardy joined us a few years back. He's now finished his third deal. So he's basically did, his first one was um, an upwards of a commercial to a five bed ensuite HMO. Then he converted an office into two cottages. Then he's done sort of a mix of projects one and two where he's created two self-contained flats and a five bed HMO out of um, a former defunct commercial property. Lauren's obviously joined the team. And again, she's working with us, but she's now starting probably one of the bigger projects that she's done, which is like a new build, two bed house and a five, six bed HMO all on one. So it's for us, it's that's the excitement, just seeing, helping other people and seeing the joy that comes and helping them through you know the ups and downs of that process. I love it. Sounds like some old school principles of just getting down to work, you know, sort of doing the basics, doing them well, and trying to lift everybody up on the way. And I think, you know what, that is a fantastic place for us to finish today, Mark. It's been a real pleasure to chat to you on the show. Um, been looking forward to sitting down and, and chatting shop with you for a while. I feel like, you know, this has just been two guys in the pub talking about, <laughs> talking about work, yeah. which I enjoy more than pretty much anything. And um, look, I'm sure most people know you know, where to kind of get hold of you guys if, if they, they want to reach out. But um, just on the off chance that there's anyone out there that isn't quite sure, where's the best place to contact you guys? Yeah, so we're most active on Instagram, so Savoy's Properties, and then LinkedIn, again, Savoy's Properties, you'll find us there. Fantastic. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. And I can't wait to see what's next for the Savoy's Empire. Oh, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it.